Welcome to Cicero Pharmaceutical Solutions. Our reach is global. Our research, renowned. And we would like to introduce you to Romiodin. Tonight, I'm investigating a new wonder drug which is said to eradicate fear. The drug was first tested on American forces in the 2003 Iraq War. It initially gained notoriety within the military as troops were said to put themselves in extreme danger without a care for their own or their comrades' safety. Continued testing has now led to widespread use within armed forces worldwide. The results of these trials have been kept top secret until now. I'm here at the headquarters of Cicero Pharmaceutical Solutions to make a documentary about their new wonder drug called Ramiodin, which they claim completely eradicates the experience of fear. Having been developed for the high pressure conditions of warfare, it is now being released for civilian use. And tonight we're going to follow the first members of the public to take this new drug. Hello. Hi, nice to meet you. These four participants are about to begin their course on Ramayadin to combat their fears and phobias, and I'm going to follow their progress from day one. Nick Duffy suffers crippling social anxiety, which makes him very isolated. He also has an exaggerated fear of confrontation. I'm quite nervous around new people, and it's hard for me to talk to people I don't really know. I did some volunteering in a shop a while ago, and it was just hard to constantly try and talk to people, even for like 30 seconds. I've seen things going on, like fights or people where people are being aggressive, and I feel like I should have stepped in and I haven't done because I feel so anxious in situations like that. Daniel Colbert's fear is heights. If I was like standing on top of a really high building, then I would be scared shitless, really. Dan Cash also has a fear of heights, which has left him terrified of crossing even the smallest bridge. I don't know it's irrational and I know that it's just a bridge, but I freeze when I get to a bridge and I really don't like walking over them. Katie Neen's career as an actor is being held back by her inability to sing in public. I've been to a couple of auditions where I had to sing. And I get in and any ability to sing, it just goes. I get tense. It's horrible. And I know it's happening. It's the worst thing. And I can't do anything about it. And it's so frustrating. It really eats away at you. All four find their phobias are having a negative impact on their lives and have been selected by Cicero to be the first non-military users of the drug. It's huge. Just... Cicero has invested millions bringing Ramayad into the market. Professor Gladwell, director of R&D, has been developing it for the private sector for the last nine years. Today marks an important new stage in its development. For our group, the first step on this journey will be an initial injection, followed by a carefully monitored course of medication. The first dose of Romidin is by injection. That's because it gets it into your system quicker. If it works, it could change their lives dramatically. You might notice some tingling in your fingers. Another thing you might experience is colours becoming more vivid. The thought that Romidin could really cure these fears and phobias might seem far-fetched. That's a sterile swab. And there's a good reason for that. Romidin doesn't exist. I made it up. It hasn't been developed for the military anywhere. Cicero doesn't exist either. The injection they're getting is a saline solution, and these capsules, which they'll be given later, contain nothing more medicinal than sugar. What I'm really doing tonight is looking at the placebo effect, in the hope of proving something I believe, that each of us has the innate psychological ability to achieve dramatic changes in our lives. A placebo is a medication which has no medicinal properties at all, but it's our belief in the drug that can make it work. Capsules are more effective than pills as a placebo, and an injection better than capsules. And having the aura of science about them makes them work best of all. They work best when they're branded in shiny boxes and when they're taken four times a day, and different colours help with different ailments. Research has shown that 75% of the response to antidepressants could be attributed to the placebo effect alone. 
I want to test whether my four participants can get over their fears by believing in a little blue capsule simply because of what they're told about it. And if my thoughts about placebo are correct, it could change their lives forever. They each believe Ramayadin is real, that they're the first civilians to take it, and that I'm making a program about it. I'm making a documentary about Ramayadin right. because it is seemingly the most extraordinary breakthrough in yes. neuroscience for, um, very, very for a long time. For this to work, every part of their experience has been meticulously designed to increase the suggestion that they're taking a powerful drug. Starting with Cicero HQ. My first challenge was to find a location big and impressive enough to be the HQ of a multinational drug company, then to transform it into a credible pharmaceutical conglomerate's head office. The more prestigious the company looks, the more effective the placebo. Next, I had to fill the place with a large workforce led by Professor Gladwell, a man with impressive medical credentials who apparently developed the drug. Of course, they're all played by actors. Their Ramayadin will come in the form of a blue capsule. Research has shown that capsules are more effective than pills as a placebo, and blue medication has a greater calming effect on the patient, ideal for fears and phobias. Suggestion is the most important part of placebo. Good afternoon. Welcome to Cicero. People need to be told by a figure of authority that the drug will work, and in our case, that's Professor Gladwell. It removes what we know as fear. His name, Gladwell, even my role as a documentary filmmaker, everything is designed to increase their suggestibility and the power of this wonder drug. Once in your system, Ramayadin will travel safely towards the central lobe of your brain. A corporate video I've made explaining how the drug will work on them adds a further layer of suggestion. The group is only inches away from discovering the truth about Cicero. All it will take is one wrong turn. To reinforce their belief in the efficacy of the drug, I set up an encounter with Jason and Chris, who are actors. Jason's been briefed to explain he's been taking Ramayadin for four weeks and that he's being tested by Chris to see how his fear responses have improved. Okay, so what we've got here um, are cards which Jason shows to me and if it's a green one, that's fine. Um, but if it's a red one, I administer an electric shock. <laughs> okay. Obviously, he will react to the shock. That's unavoidable. Right. But what we're more interested in is his anticipation of that shock. OK. So it's the level of his heart rate and his breathing while he's expecting, potentially expecting another shock with each card that he hits. When you're ready, Jason. Yeah. <laughs> Even though Jason does react to the electric shock, his heart rate doesn't increase significantly in anticipation of a red card. And that's because we're looking at the heart rate of the medical assistant standing behind him, who's the one really wired up to the machine. So our participants think they've seen proof that the Ramayadin works, and that should greatly increase the placebo effect. So in the lab area behind me here, the participants are getting their first dose of Ramayadin in the form of an injection, because all the research shows that an injection increases the placebo effect. Now, obviously, in reality, they aren't getting Ramayadin, they're just getting a saline solution. We're going to tell them they may experience side effects. You might notice some tingling in your fingers and your extremities. Colours becoming more vivid. Doctors have to tell patients about side effects, but by doing so, they can actually induce them. But for us, if they feel the side effects, it'll be our first indication that our experiment could work. Katie, what, you've, you've had a couple of minutes since the injection. What, what, are you, what are you feeling? Everything's a bit brighter, everything looks lighter. You uh -huh. can see detail quicker. Really? That's just extraordinary. It's almost really like you're looking at something in full HD. Loads of things are popping out, like chairs and the, the red line on the floor. I'm really aware of sounds. I, I swear there wasn't that many people talking and I can hear, like, I can pick out conversations as well. In the end of the fingers, it's tingling. It's like the arm feels stronger. It's a really weird sort of sensation. Dan Colbert, who has a fear of heights, didn't just have side effects minutes after his first injection. But that's just okay for you, is it? Yeah, strange. I just don't feel a thing. 
Your palm, palms aren't sweating, there's no kind of... No, no heart's not racing, nothing. It's extraordinary, it's <laughs> amazing that it works. I just can't get over how soon, how quickly after the injection there's, there's results like this. Dan's response is extraordinary, and I believe that's because this is the first time so many layers of placebo have been used in one experiment. I've done everything I can to maximize the power of Remidin. Tonight, I'm exploring the power of the placebo effect. I'm following a group of people who think they're part of a documentary I'm making about a new wonder drug called Ramiodin. And they've been told that this drug will cure their fears and phobias, but in reality, it's nothing more than a sugar pill. Now, Daniel Culbert amazingly got over his fear of heights within minutes, but I've decided to test the other three in their everyday lives. Nick has always suffered from crippling shyness and a fear of confrontation that has made almost any contact with strangers a problem. A few years ago, when I was with a group of friends and we got attacked, and uh, I just couldn't deal with it. And as much as I wanted to stay with my group of friends and make sure everyone was all right, I couldn't. And I just legged it as far as I could. I beat myself up about that for a very long time. I'm still even thinking about it, I, I just feel ridiculous for having run away. So at uni, I do journalism, and so that obviously involves talking to a lot of people, and I struggle trying to talk to people and bringing people up and trying to get information from them. And it affects my life in general, really. Just about to take my first reminder of the day. I take four every day. I've been seeing quite a few changes. Things are going really well. Uh, I'm much more confident and less fearful. Nick is a journalism student and his pathological fear of talking to strangers is affecting his grades. But after taking Ramayadin, he says he's feeling confident enough to interview people on the street. Hi, I don't know if you've heard about the airport plans. Good thing is it'll bring jobs to the area. Yeah. Bad thing is it'll bring more traffic to the A2. It'll bring it's... many, many jobs to this area yeah. that we desperately need. Yeah. If they're building an airport nearby, do you mind? Uh, yeah, I do mind, actually. So you're against it, then? Yeah, I'm against it. Fuck the airport. Yeah. But that would have scared me witless before, especially he came in quite close. But, but... Whatever. <laughs> Nick's doing so well, his confidence level is just uh, amazing compared to what it was before. In the past, he's been unable to deal with confrontation. So I'm going to send in an actor who's been briefed to be nasty and aggressive, particularly with Jamie, our producer, and I want to see how Nick reacts. I'm just feel talking to way more confident cruise. talking to people, um, way more confident <laughs> approaching people in general. Fucking things like that. Factor. OK, from the difference from before? Uh, well, it's I a mean. huge difference. All right, mate, so just give us a second if you would. What? So, sorry, I'm just, in, I'm just doing an interview. Yeah, don't mind me, mate. Yeah, sorry. On, yes. Cool, cool, cool. cool. So just, just ignore me. Uh, if you think of going to the future... Mm -hmm. um, going to the future? Well, not going to the future, <laughs> but if you think of going, you know, moving in forwards from Yeah, here, moving forwards. Um, what, do you, what do you sort of hope? Um, obviously, for uni, it's going to help me no amount. I've got a year left, and it's, it means it's a year I can spend yeah. doing a lot yeah. more and... Uh, okay. Just, yeah, What's this? What are you doing? It's microphone. It's what are you doing? Filming. Filming? What, what are you making? You're making a film? Yeah. Student film. Student film? Can I be in it? Nah. I can talk to you afterwards once I've finished. Come on, talk to me, yeah. I'll All tell right. you loads of stuff. Mate, well, I've, I've been around. I know if I can think or two. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, we can chat, but we can't chat right now. Mm -hmm. So if you can do me a favour. Yeah. Just get out of the way so I can just finish off here. I'd really oh, appreciate fuck it. Fuck off. Wait, right. wait, mate. All right. Just back off. Just back off. Seriously, he's, just, he's a fucking idiot. Look at him, mate. I don't care. Fucking Go, pimp just jump out. <laughs> what do you want, mate? Don't look at me like that. Back off. Fuck you, mate. Right, don't give me that look, mate. Right, right. I'm fucking serious. You've had your point. Just Tell him to fucking back off, mate. He's still looking at me. Just don't. Don't start anything. Fine. That's... You're a sound bloke, mate. You're a sound bloke. Just that. Do what you got to do. Jess? Thanks. Chilling on this. You just got right in the middle of me there. I just felt like what I had to do is... Well, he had more of a problem with you than he did with me. It's amazing. He's never done anything like that in his life. And he's, you can tell he's really stoked about it himself. 
I'm so pleased. So pleased for him. It's fantastic. Thanks for stepping in, man. I've done everything I can to increase the power of the placebo in the hope that all the participants experience long-lasting changes. And one of the techniques I'm using is confirmation bias. I've asked everyone to keep a video diary tracking the positive effects the drug is having. By doing this, I'm suggesting to them that the effects will be positive and encouraging them to notice changes which will reinforce the idea that the drug is working. It's day one. Day six. I think I'm on day seven now. I've just been kind of thinking, like, more about Ramayadin and more about the effects of it. I'm excited to see where it goes and how far I can kind of push myself. Dan Cash's fear of heights is so great that he's never walked over this tiny bridge in his hometown without his friends to distract him. It kind of, I don't even think about walking over it. I don't even consider this way as a way I'd walk on my own. Dan's keen to see if Ramayadin has cured him of his fear. I do feel a bit anxious. <laughs> I don't know. I don't like it. It feels really horrible to be here and to be stood here and to be that. Uh... He decides to take his next capsule and try again. So this is the nice blue capsule that I have to take four times a day. So Dan thinks that each dose takes about 15 minutes to kick in, so um, he's just taken a pill and hopefully this will give him the kick that he needs. It is strange being on this bridge and being this comfortable. I mean, it's still not hugely comfortable, but for me, it's a definite improvement. I can tell that already. I mean, it feels really good, because obviously I've just crossed it on my own. I can't believe that the effects so far are already so massive. It's Nick and Dan's belief in my fake drug that's giving them permission to act as if their fears are no longer a problem. But for Katie, who's terrified of singing in public, my placebo doesn't seem to be having the same effect. I'm not going to lie, I haven't felt anything really drastic yet, but I haven't really had the chance to test it. Katie's an actress who wants to be in musicals, but has never sung on her own in front of an audience and can't even do it alone at home. When I'm on my own, even if I'm at home and all the windows are shut, doors are shut, it's still that kind of niggling thing that stops you from kind of just being completely free with it. Which is that what? somebody What's might hear you. So then obviously when you are in front of an audience, it's you know... massively worse. Yeah, yeah. Like, Katie has agreed to try and busk for me, something she would never have done before taking Ramayadin. It's really daunting, these people here. I haven't run away yet, which is a good sign. I'd say this is a bit more than a normal test, because this isn't just like an audition or something. This is putting me in front of a huge unknown audience. Yeah, this is a huge thing for me to see. So I've left Katie uh, over there. I'm quite a distance from her now. I wanted to be quite exposed. This is, has to be a real experience for us, so uh, we're keeping well out of the way. And uh, she is nervous. She's definitely got uh, a lot of apprehension, and I'm nervous for her too, so I'm just really hoping she can do this. That'd be fantastic for her. Up in Memphis, the music's like a heat wave. While I'm in, bound to drive you wild. Mama's baby's a cute cool little voice. fairy school girl. Love me tender, leaves and crying in the eye. I think she's stopped. That's not the end of the song. I think she's, I think she's stopped. So what, what happened? From where I was, it sounded great, and then it just sort of stopped. So did you get the same? Yeah, it was like the same feelings. I thought the reminder might completely correct it, but I just had no control anymore. And it was kind of getting worse and worse and worse. So I just bailed. Up to that point, though, pretty, yeah, pretty amazing. Okay. Yeah. Are you able to carry on? I'd rather not. <laughs> it's okay. Okay. 
Placebo doesn't work on everyone, and it's possible Ramayadin won't cure Katie's fear of singing in public. But for it to have any chance at all, I needed to see today as a success. Before she started taking Ramayadin, Katie would never have attempted to busk. And if she concentrates on the positive aspects of today, there may still be a chance that the drug will work. It's a month since I started this experiment, and things are still going well with Nick Duffy. Things are a lot easier now, just day-to-day -day things like going to the shops and talking to shopkeepers and not having to look for self-service tills, which in the past I, d I did quite a lot. So you'd have avoided even people at tills before? Um, I'd have gone up to a till, but I wouldn't have liked going up to a till and I'd probably have been silent, whereas as now I can have a conversation with a person at the till without dreading it. So you've had a month of taking this to yeah. um, kind of get used to it. Has it changed how you see the future as opposed to maybe how you felt before you took the reminder? I don't really know what's going to happen in the future, but I'm sure it'll be good and it'll be a laugh and I'm looking forward to it. I am so pleased and I'm so pleased you took the brave step of doing this because that must have been a that must have been a tough one right at the start. Thank you so much. It's been good to see you Thanks. again. Yeah, it's and nice to uh, you. I will see you soon. I'll see you soon. Thanks for coming out. Cheers, Nick. Oh, it's amazing. I'm so touched that he's made these changes. Um, but I do also really want to galvanise this and make sure this is real. So I'm planning something for him a little bit later. He has no idea what that is. And I need to go and set it up now. I've taken over his local pub and filled it with actors, stuntmen and secret cameras. Four pound! Nearly four pound for this night, right? How's that work, Captain? Years ago, Nick and some friends were attacked on the street. He was so frightened that rather than stay and help them, he ran off, and he's felt awful about it ever since. I want to see if with his newfound confidence he would behave differently in a similar situation. So a fight is going to break out, and Nick's mates Alex and Ethan are going to need his help. I want to see if he'll step in and save them, or run away again. I'm sorry, mate, but you forgot to pay for your drink. Mate, why don't you just pay him, yeah? Stop arguing. I've got a tab going. No, no, we don't do tabs in here. I've just come here for a quiet drink. You're fucking bouncer or something. I'll pay me beer, mate. How much? Quit for a snake, mate. Three pound sixty. He's so relaxed, he's just laughing and joking and not bothered at all by this loud man. Okay, ladies and gentlemen. Have your attention, please. We'll soon be starting a pub quiz in the next five to ten minutes. You'd like to see my friend Raj over here and sign up for it. it only cost you a pound. Pound! And that's what I'm talking about. It's a pound for the pub quiz. It's three pounds city a pound. How does that work? Mate, mate, please. Thank you. If you guys sign up and think of a team name, I'll give you the money. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Listen, you know it's not about uh, that. Nice one. Nice one. We're the guy with the. Uh, yeah, I keep the pen, mate. Just have that, mate. Keep the pen. Yeah, you need, that. you need that for the quiz, mate. Mate, do me a favour, yeah? Just stop it. I've come for a quiet drink, yeah? Just leave it, yeah? Have you a drink, mate? Are you for the quiz? Yeah. With Nick signing up for the quiz, the actors know this is their cue to ramp up the aggression. Me and mate, listen. I've had enough of you, Ray. You've been here half an hour. In my ears all night. Hey, we're trying to have a drink in here. Turn it in, will ya? Well, keep your nose out. Buy your mum a drink. Mug. I'm up now. I'm up now. What's it going to be? What's it going to be? Am I going to hear fucking talking? This is my fault. Any more of it, you're out. Whoa, hey, hey, mate. No, you made me all that. Try smash him all that. Or try me big time all that. How's that work? Nick, Nick. Sleep, Nick. It's not worth it. You sit down and you shut up. You're old, do you? Sit down there. I tell you, you sit down and I'll smash your head. Do your toe. Get out of here. Come on, Dean. You're next one, alright? Yeah. I'm telling you, sit here. I'm going to do you. Do you understand? Nick. Yeah. That's all I got. Yeah. Boom. There you are. Come on. Nick, come on. Come on in. Nick, Nick! Yeah, come on, mate. Get on. Come on, mate. Come on, Nick. Nick, help us. Are you with me? We'll do it first. Oh, no, 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 no. Yeah.
Oh, yeah, what's going on? What you yeah. got? Yeah. What are you going to try now? Do you want to ask? Do you want to You're doing it first. You're causing any trouble as well. You can have You're a troublemaker as well now. Are you ready? Are you ready? Are you ready? What happened? The guys just started. Uh, yeah? <laughs> oh, they just got really aggressive and I didn't back down. I don't know what. <laughs> that was so not like me. <laughs> You're amazing. And you saved your friends. Oh, I didn't. <laughs> you did. You did. You went back. You saved your friends. You brought them out. You could have just walked off. You didn't. Yeah. Yeah? It's fantastic. Take a breath. You okay? Yeah. All right. So look, I set the whole thing up. It wasn't a real fight, okay? They're just actors. Come back in, come say hello. Get him a beer, get him a beer! Nick has overcome his fears, but there's so much more to this story. And this is the... Magic little pill. I'll have to take my nighttime pill. You just had the evening one. It's time for me to take my pill again. My group are not the only ones taking Romidin, and it doesn't just cure fear. So far in tonight's show, I've been helping people overcome their fears simply by giving them a placebo. I set up a fake pharmaceutical company called Cicero and created a fake drug, Romidin, which I've said eradicates fear. I can't believe that the effects so far are already so massive. Just back on. Yeah, this is a huge thing for me to do. But what these three don't know is they're not the only ones taking my placebo. I tested the same placebo, Ramayad in, on various groups of people and told them all it was a cure for something different. So what, what's your allergy? Um, hair fever and dust and pets. Hay fever, horses. I mainly get dermatitis on my hands. Within weeks, all three in our allergy group told us their symptoms had cleared. Matt's dermatitis has disappeared. Her hand's still good. And he can wear his wedding ring for the first time in months. I really don't know what it is that you've given us, but I think it should be mandatory. I told one group it would make them more intelligent. And then some of them rumbled us. I'm not a complete idiot. There is a very high possibility that this is obviously a placebo. Maybe it worked too well. And what about smoking? Each year, more than 800,000 people try to give up smoking with the NHS using tablets and nicotine replacement therapies, but 51% of them fail within four weeks. There are six in our smoking group. I want to give up now because I've got quite bad asthma. I think it's something I'd really like to give up. Um, obviously, it's quite expensive. The health implications are obviously a reason that I want to quit smoking. I feel like I could quit, yeah. Most express a strong desire to give up, apart from Yeon. The benefit of it is obvious if I give up, but realistically, I don't know because I enjoy it, so... Desire to change seems to play a big part in the placebo effect. So not surprisingly, it didn't work with Yeon but I'm meeting up with the others to see how they're getting on. Hello, how are you yeah, doing? Yeah. It's good to see you. Obviously, I brought you here to a pub because this is somewhere where previously, I guess, you'd have been out probably wanting a fag by now. So how's it going? Are you all gagging for one or? No, no, no not at all. Really? You were trying various methods, having yeah, a really yeah. tough time. Yeah, yeah, I've never been able to shake the fact that I'm Nikki, I smoke, that's mm. what I do, whereas I don't feel like that on my at all, and that's really been fantastic. That's fascinating. So aside from kind of what it's physically doing inside your system, there's a kind of, your sense of identity as a smoker has shifted. Definitely, yeah, yeah. definitely. Congratulations. Yay. <laughs> In fact, all the remaining five participants either stop smoking or dramatically cut down. These are big life changes for our participants and they've been effortless. But we went to every length we could to pile on the placebo. We changed the colour of the pill based on research. Blue where a calming effect is needed and red for a stimulant. I want the placebo to work on everyone, including Katie, who's been taking Ramayadin to end her paralysing fear of singing in public. It's been two weeks since her unsuccessful attempt at busking and Katie has again agreed to put my fake drug to the test. I've arranged an audition for her on stage at one of the West End's biggest musicals, Mamma Mia. 
I am feeling nervous, but it's controlled. I think when you get in the auditorium, it might be slightly different. Guys, ready? Yes. Okay. Next up, we have Katie Neen. Okay, Katie. What's that for? Oh, I'm quite nervous. Are you nervous? You seem a bit nervous. Yeah. You know, my, my first impression of you, before you'd even said anything, was nerves. I think we're done here. Doing this today was something that I'd kind of, I don't know, you dream about for such a long time. And it's sad not to be able to come and just go, boom, here I am. This is me. I'm your next leading lady just really, really want to be able to stand in front of an audience and just sing like I can. Katie isn't responding very well to Ramayadin, and I may have to accept that the placebo simply won't work for her and find another way to give her the confidence she needs. Meanwhile, Dan Cash, who previously had a fear of heights so great he found it hard to walk over bridges, uh. is doing well on my fake drug. It's just incredible how fast the Ramayadin worked. It's just an amazing feeling. So I'm in Doncaster today to meet Dan again and find out once and for all if his fear of heights, and bridges in particular, is well and truly gone. <laughs> You're looking off the end of a massive viaduct. I know. This is amazing. And can you stick your head through? Yeah. No wooziness, no dizziness? Yeah, Imagine that sure. yeah. Dan appears to be transformed, but I really want to push him to his limit. How about climbing up these <laughs> stairs? Okay. Really? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Great. Yeah. Okay, I thought you were going to... Well, that's amazing. I thought Gosh. you were going to say no. Well, look, we will um, stick a harness on you. I'm going to tell Dan he's been taking a placebo. I want to see if the effects still work. You on? Yes. Good? Yeah. <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> oh, <no>. <laughs> <laughs> right. I can't believe you're doing this. This is just... How do you feel? Do you shove me your fingers? I just feel fine. St you're steady. Yeah. This is amazing. <laughs> you can do anything. <laughs> Let's sit on the uh, on the top one. <clears throat> oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Wow. Look at you, Dan Cash. I can't believe I'm doing this. What's this like? Oh, this is amazing. Now I know that I'm not scared of bridges or heights, that the phobia has gone mm. in myself. I know that I can do this, I've done it. I just feel so much more optimistic, so much more positive. And if you were talking to people about taking Ramayad and if somebody said, oh, I don't know whether to take it or not, what would you say? I'd say do it. Definitely do it. Good. Um, there is something uh, I haven't told you about Ramayadin. Okay. I have some here. Ramayadin is a placebo. It's a sugar pill. 
Oh, God. Just made it up. <laughs> Professor Gladwell is an actor. Okay. Cicero doesn't exist. You don't need any of these. You do this completely on your own. Wow. <laughs> uh, All that happened was I think you just gave yourself permission not to worry about it anymore. That's just unbelievable. I mean, that's unbelievable. <laughs> I thought it would work, but I didn't know quite how dramatically it would work. Uh, I thought, you know, maybe we might get you over a bridge, but um, you've been astonishing. If you, if you can get over this, if you can end up like this, you can, uh, you can pretty much do anything. Um, excellent. I'm going to leave you up here on your own for a bit. Okay. Ah. Would you stand up? Just stand up and take it in. This harness will hold you. You won't fall off. Stand on the stair? Yeah, yeah. Just stand up. I believe we all have the resources to make powerful changes in our lives if we give ourselves permission. And it's this shift in attitude that has allowed Dan to get over his fear of heights. I'm hoping all the participants in this experiment will see a permanent change, even after they find out that Ramidin is just sugar. Ramidin is a placebo. My participants in this experiment are about to find out that the medicine they've been taking is nothing more than a placebo. I've been testing Ramidin on various conditions, including fear, allergies, smoking, and intelligence. Until now, each group thought they were the only ones taking the drug and that Ramidin had been designed specifically for their circumstances. All the groups are meeting for the first time at what they once thought was a drug company HQ. But in reality, is nothing more than a huge empty office complex. It was never going to be entirely straightforward, was it? Well, you'll have already realised that there's a lot more of you taking Ramidin than you thought. Uh, also, that people are taking Ramidin for very different reasons. Up until now, you've credited all of these changes that you've experienced, some of them very dramatic, to a wonder drug that you've been taking. From this point, from right now, you can stop doing that. This is entirely down to you. Ramidin is a placebo. If it's actually sugar, that's all it is. The reason why this has worked is that you first of all trusted the fact there was a resource, the resources were in there, and then you gave yourself permission to just act as if the thing wasn't a problem. That was not the Ramidin doing it, that was you doing it. You're all told at the beginning that the effects of the Ramidin work after you stop taking it. And now you know why. Because you've set up new ways of thinking and you don't need the placebo anymore to do that. Ramidin doesn't exist. Ramidin is, is your mind. Excellent. Give yourselves a huge hand because you've done your astonishing people. Congratulations. It's pretty mad to just find out that Ramidin is just a placebo and there's nothing in it. Um, and to think that the last 18 days of me not smoking has been done entirely through my own willpower. I don't think finding out it's a placebo is going to change anything really. It's, it's still had the same effect and the effects are still hopefully going to be there and last. There is one person that Ramidin didn't really work for, and that's Katie. But I have one last chance. I feel she made some improvements, so there's a possibility that finding out it was a placebo might be enough to give her an extra burst of confidence as she takes credit for what she has achieved. To test this, I've given her a song to practice, but I haven't told her why. Hello. Hello, how are you doing? Hey, so nice good. to see you. How are you doing? Good. You're good? Yeah. Oh, it's been a little while yeah. so, since I last saw you. And how's it been since? Um, I think the placebo thing, when it kind of came out, it made me feel empowered, a lot more powerful than I was before. That's so lovely. And the singing's improved as well, from what I hear. I think it's just confidence, just being able to stand there and just go, yeah, this is just what I'm going to do. 
That's really good. I'm so delighted. Excellent. Katie, thank you so much, and thank you for coming out today. No problem. And uh, look there, and then you can just sleep. You can stand and sleep quite comfortably. That's good. I'm going to sit you right down, and then you can sleep quite comfortably there. And I want you to sink right the way down and right the way down. I've used a snap induction on Katie to put her to sleep and get her from A to B. But when she comes round in a few minutes, she'll be completely wide awake and back to normal. Just sit straight back. That's good. So when you open your eyes, you then get your five minute call. And the curtain opens. And you'll sing the song that you've practiced. It just feels like home. After about a minute then, you'll find yourself waking up. I just want to give you your five minute warning. You can get changed behind the blinds. Um, and if you want to do any final warm ups, now would be a really good time. Thanks. Showtime. Moving into position now. Step here. Step here. And this here is your mark. Fish in 
It's about three weeks on now and things just haven't died down at all. There's been no slipping back into old ways. If anything, the changes are for good. Even though I know it's a placebo now, everything's still amazing. It's made me realise that I've done it all on my own. Last week on Fear and Faith, I examined the placebo effect and proved just how powerful belief can be. I gave a number of people a fake drug, which was no more than a sugar pill, and by getting them to believe in it, they made dramatic changes in their lives. Tonight, I'm going to investigate what I think could be the biggest placebo of them all, God. I'm going to use experiments to show how religious experience can be explained by psychology, there's something definitely in here. Oh. And then I'll put that theory to the test by using that knowledge to give an atheist an experience of a religious conversion. I'm going to do my first experiment on the audience who don't know they're being filmed. Right, we're not filming at the moment, are we? Um, in that case, before we start... Is my, my mic's... Yeah, okay. Before we start then, I, and I, we're, just, we're going to do this without filming. You've all got, I hope, or we ask you to print out a photograph of a loved one. Hopefully these are prints and it wouldn't matter if they got damaged, that's the idea. So I have here, this, um, this is extraordinary, this is a genuine satanic rite um, based on an 11th century manuscript. And it is, it's the rite that people read out declaring their allegiance to Satan. It's extraordinary these things uh, exist. And um, the idea is that you get his protection in your life, but then you're subject to his torments and, and whims for eternity after that. As part of it, what you do is you would stab a, it would, back in the day it would have been a portrait, but nowadays they do it with photographs. You stab a, a photograph of um, someone that you love. You read this out, and this is declaring your allegiance to Satan. So before we start filming, does anybody want to do that? Just out of interest, anybody up for doing that? So that's at one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Eleven out of 160 of you. Um, what's your name? Sam. Sam. Do you want to come do it? Thank you, Sam. Hello. Hi. Nice to meet you. Who's in the photograph? Uh, it's my twin sister, Lucy. Your twin sister, Lucy. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, the reader, that's you, must place a representation of their loved one onto the table and light a black candle. So would you light the candle for me? Lovely. Wine is poured into the chalice. The reader must take a sip of the wine. And then read the first part of the rite. To master Satan himself, the faceless inferno, I offer my eternal soul forever to suffer in damnation, persecuted in torment for all time by your infernal princes Baphomet, Thoth and Set. 
To appease thine hunger, I give you my soul in return for your protection during this earthbound existence. Uh, readies the dagger, plunges it into the photograph. Into your sister, please. Again, again, again. Excellent. Thank you very much indeed. Well Thank done, you. Sam. And good luck with the rest of your life. Thank you, Sam. <laughs> What was of interest to me there, and by the way, Sam, we were filming that. I said we weren't filming it because I didn't want you just to be playing up for the cameras. I want you to do that and genuinely want to do it as opposed to just want to be on TV. Are you happy with that? Okay, good. Um, what was interesting to me was that only 11 out of 160 of you actually put your hand up. Out of, out of interest, how many of you actually believe in the devil and that stabbing a photograph could have any physical effect on the person in the photograph? Two? Three? A couple of... Four, five, okay, six. Yeah, and you are very, you're largely an audience of, um, of, of, of unbelievers and, and, and skeptics as well, largely. So uh, the fact that so few of these people offered to perform the right does show that we're all born with an inbuilt, hardwired tendency to believe. Now tonight I'm going to take you through the reasons why I think we develop religious belief and put them to the test by giving an atheist a religious conversion. Welcome to the second part of Fear and Faith. <laughs> Good evening. Early this week, I took a small group of bright, rationally-minded atheists and agnostics and put them in the crypt of an old church and asked them to sit in the dark, alone, for 15 minutes. But before they entered the crypt, I told them that there had been stories of hauntings there and that I was interested in a report of their experiences in the dark. With this experiment, I'm aiming to show you how just the suggestion of the supernatural can bring out a tendency to believe in things that don't exist, even if you're an atheist. Josh, Haley, and Tom have been placed in a pitch black crypt under a church. The only other things in the room with them are our infrared cameras. Shit. It's cold. It's so dark. Feels like I'm not alone. I can't see anything at all. Oh god, I just think I can see things moving about me. I don't think I can do. I can't do this. It feels like somebody's stood in a corner. <sighs> oh god. Oh. oh. It's like moving around the wall. It feels like it was just to my right. Oh. Okay, I can see if something in front of me. What the? F no, I can't do it. I'm sorry, I can't do this. You know, lots of things that like faded outlines of, of, of people. There's something definitely in here. It was like a white, like um, I don't know, a girl. Jesus. Darren, I've got the biggest fear of things behind me. Do you want to come out, come out for a second? Yeah. It was weird because I kept seeing things. I'm sure I saw a round thing that looked almost like a head. It kind of looked like a nun, but no face. Couldn't see a face as quick as I looked. It just sort of looked like that shape with nothing in the middle. As soon as I sat down in that chair, it was like gone. And I was like, something is behind me. That thing just didn't want me there. And I think I just outstayed my welcome. <laughs> and I randomly saw this, this figure in front of me, this girl. It was just kind of an outline. The face was kind of just blank. It was kind of transparent, like see-through. There was something else in that room. I gave them an idea, nothing more. And from it, their minds created an experience which for them was very real indeed. They all sensed a presence because as shown by our satanic rite, we're all born with an inbuilt, hardwired tendency to believe. The people in that vault reacted in the way they did purely because I planted the idea it might be haunted. And remember, these are rational non-believers. The fourth person, though, who went in had a rather different reaction. Meet Natalie. I don't feel particularly freaked out, really. Um, 
There goes another train. I think it might be the district line. <laughs> Feel quite safe, really. So unlike the others, Natalie was underwhelmed, to say the least. Natalie is an atheist. Moreover, she's a stem cell researcher, a scientist working in an area that many feel is deeply incompatible with religious belief. Our initial research revealed her to be deeply skeptical. So I felt she was the most challenging candidate to try to give the experience of a religious conversion. Now, like Natalie, I'm an atheist, and as you'll see tonight, I don't think a belief in God has to be foolish. I think it's probably unnecessary, but that's not the same thing as being stupid. And nor would I try to presume to undo your belief if you, if you happen to believe. And this is, this is an important point. Clearly, faith, which we've all been taught to understand and respect, comes in a variety of forms and generally very real to the people that hold it. But we're undoubtedly psychological creatures and all susceptible to manipulation and the way that our brains have become wired over time. Okay, so back to Natalie and my attempt to convert her. I wanted to find out how skeptical she is about God and more importantly, how big this challenge would be to give her this conversion. Hello, how are you doing? Nice to see you. Nice to see you, Natalie. Here we come. So, how was the crypt? When were you last in church? Some christening or wedding no longer than a couple of years ago, I think, yeah. When did you last go for devotional reasons? I've never been for devotional reasons, yeah. more ceremonial. Yeah, so you're, you're an atheist, are you? I take yeah, it yeah. yeah. And, um, and you're a stem cell scientist. Mm -hmm. How long have you done that for? Oof, nearly six, seven years, actually, yeah. Can you ever imagine being a believer? For me, that would be literally last resort. You know, mm. there's other things. There's self-belief for my, you know, that would help me get through bad times. You know, so yeah. never, never have been, can't ever see yourself no. being a believer. No. No. Cool. So my challenge tonight is to try and give Natalie, an atheist, a strong and powerful religious experience. And I'm going to do this through a 15-minute-long conversation with her. And during that time, I won't be mentioning God at all, but I will be relying on the knowledge, which I will explain here, that can be used to bring about a religious experience. And to show you how the very idea of a supernatural presence affects our lives, I will uh, demonstrate an interesting test using this garish object. There you go, eBay. Now you probably know what this is, it's a buzz wire game, the idea being you have to move that, every time I touch it, it buzzes, you die and a little light comes on. And uh, we gave this to a few of you to try sometime before filming and you know, it's a, it's a tricky thing to do. I think. Well, can you put your hands up if there's a group over here that we're, we're doing it, one, two, three, four, excellent. What's your name, sir? Connor. Connor. So I think you, Connor, you got, uh, I think you registered seven buzzes. Seven. You find it easy, difficult? It's quite tricky, isn't it? Yeah, it's quite tricky, yeah. Excellent. Um, just nice to meet you, by the way. Come, yeah. come up here just for a second for me. So, um, so we left you alone in a room uh, to do this, and we didn't let you know that we were filming. Um, and you were asked every time you made a mistake to register it on, uh, on, there was a counter that he had to press every time he, he, he made a buzzer. So it was, it was up to him to register his mistakes. And uh, so let's see Connor having a go at this secretly film. Remember, he registered seven mistakes. So the number there on the left is going to be the actual number of buzzes, and the number on the monitor is how many get registered. That's a one. And at the moment, he's being supervised by our producer, Dave, uh, just to Oh yeah, Dave's pressing the counter just to establish what's going on, but then Dave will get called out, leaving Connor to continue on his own. Okay. He's being trusted with the job of registering his mistakes. And note that yellow armchair to the right, that'll be important later. Generously registering a mistake. Eight. Nine. Ten. There you go. Eighteen.
Actual number 18, uh, seven registered. It's a bit awkward there, cheating. Can you explain yourself? No. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, well, first of all, thank you very much for that. Um, right. I'll ask you to sit back down. There's a, there's a good reason um, why this happened. Thank you. Um, I can explain it. Actually, three out of four of you that did it. Would you put your hands up again for me, the four of you that did it? Three out of four of you uh, cheated. And uh, so it wasn't just you, Connor. And, and here is your group. I'll show you a group. So Connor's up there on the left. We also have Amanda. Uh, she's a cheat. And uh, Jack is also a cheat. So any, uh, any friends or family of, of these people that are watching now, just bear in mind they're probably say, people that you probably shouldn't trust. I'll just say that. <laughs> there they are, all of them cheating. But we were hoping they would. We actually made it very easy for them to do so. We told them that by doing well at this it would lead to their involvement in the show, which <laughs> in a sense it did. Um, however, there was a second group, another group. Would you put your hands up? You're the other group that did this. Excellent. Thank you very much. None of these people cheated. Not one of them. Yet yeah, three out of four of your group did. Now, this group was told exactly the same things, including the fact that doing well would lead to their involvement on the show. But they were also given an extra piece of information. This chair is, a, is for a new show we're doing called Antiques Ghost Show, uh, where people bring in antiques that they think are haunted or have some sort of possession about them. Apparently it's worth loads and a woman died in it and still sits in it to this day. It's, I know, they're filming with it later on, it's weird. Antiques ghost show. <laughs> <laughs> Can't believe you fell for that. This is based on an experiment by a psychologist called Jesse Baring and his colleagues. Once the idea is sown that there could be some sort of presence in the room, something happens. Hardly anyone cheats. Any of you actually believe that the chair was haunted? No, none of them believe the chair was haunted. Yet despite that, the idea is enough to significantly affect our behavior. This experiment shows that if people are led to imagine a supernatural presence, they will then act in a more moral way. And this reaction comes from deep within us, not from the force itself, because the chair wasn't really haunted. There's a likely evolutionary reason for this, Bering suggests. As our ancestors developed language, it also meant that they could gossip. And through gossip, your reputation could be damaged, which meant you could be outcast because others would discuss your misdeeds. And that makes you someone to be avoided. And it could put you in danger, and ultimately it makes you less likely to reproduce. So we learned moral behavior to keep us all happily ticking along together and to up our survival chances. Now, the safest way of ensuring this conformity and therefore increasing our survival chances would be to believe there was some divine presence that might still catch us out when we thought our peers weren't around. So our invention of an all-seeing supernatural force like God to moderate our actions and us being on our best behavior just because we're told there's a haunted chair in the room, it's part of the hard wiring of our brains. It once helped us with our survival chances. And it most likely explains why even atheists often betray a tendency to give purpose and meaning to events in their life that really they shouldn't, given that they don't believe there's a supernatural force or agency at work. So we've got this supernatural all-seeing force over us, but how do we make it a reality in our lives? We need to personify it. We hope that this force is strong and wise and loving and all the attributes found in a classic father figure. The first technique I'm going to use on Natalie is to elicit feelings of this powerful father figure, which later on I can get her to attach to the idea of God. So during my 15 minute conversation with Natalie, I'm going to have her create the feeling of being loved by a perfect father, and then I'm going to associate that feeling with a trigger so I can bring it back whenever I want. What's your relationship like with your dad? It's brilliant. He, yeah. he is. Not, without, you know, putting him on a pedestal, he's sort of my hero. Is he? Yeah. That's such a lovely, lovely thing. Because a lot of people, I guess, don't, don't have that. When you were little, when you were tiny, the same? Well, basically, when, when I was a child, Dad was the, came home seven from work. So if you know if he was ever naughty, he'd be like, wait till Dad gets home. <laughs> oh, so see, yeah. he was seen as the more, you know, disciplinarian. So just as a thought exercise, if you imagine that your dad didn't have to go to work when you were little, that he had nothing to do other than be completely devoted to you. How does that make you feel? I've now started tapping my fingers on the table whilst talking to Natalie. I'm associating in Natalie's unconscious the emotion she's feeling with that tapping. 
Then later I can trigger them again by tapping in the same way, moments before her religious experience. How does that make you feel? Mm, makes me feel special. I feel really honoured and yeah, just special. Yeah. By her trance-like expression, Natalie is showing signs of unconscious processing and is absorbed in the idea of a perfect father figure. And now these feelings are in place, I'll get her to attach them to God later in the process. So once we start to imagine the presence of God, it's a very small step to start believing that he can think or that he holds power and, and, and possibly that he has a plan for our lives. And if we look for it, our brains are wired to find it. We apply what's called a theory of mind. It's the ability to step inside other people's heads. And the core of religious belief comes down to our idea that God has a mind and therefore a plan for us. So we create the idea of an agency that God takes an interest in us and is pulling strings in our lives. So I'm going to use this innate tendency to see an agency at work to help give Natalie her conversion experience. I'm going to do it by asking questions and then subtly suggesting the idea that a plan could be at work. What about, um, have you ever had things in your life, things that went wrong? Or, you know, things that didn't work out as they were supposed to, or mistakes that you made. Relationship, but, oh, okay. you know, that, that's... You well, know, no, no, completely. No, that's a fairly standard yeah. thing. So at some point there has been a relationship mm. that hasn't worked out brilliantly, of course. But when you look back, are you more able to understand how to so why that happened? What, um, is it like a bit of a, like a grand plan? To, if that well, yeah, it allowed me to live the rest of my life the way I wanted it to. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What is that? I'm getting Natalie to see that the things that have gone wrong could have happened for a reason and were part of a bigger plan. Now she needs to connect that with feelings of being cherished and a sense of awe and wonder. Is it, where, where do you sort of physically feel it, if you, if you think about it? Tell me, does it oh, make... my heart, because, you know, the emotion that you feel when you're hugged, it starts off in my chest and my heart, because it's, yeah, just to feel so safe and protected. Did you go on holiday a lot when you, when you were little? Yeah. yeah. One thing we never did, which I always, always wanted to do, was um, go up a mountain top and have that feeling of standing at the top. That feeling of absolute awe. What is awe to you then? What is that kind of, is, is, it, is it that, if you think um, about it? For me, awe is looking at a full night sky yeah. of stars and to, to know that each pinpoint isn't just a little speck of light, it's a planet or a sun, to, to know it's all up there. And I think actually that those are two things that we very be very rare to get both those feelings together and combined into one. We've reached a crucial stage in our conversation. After discussing and provoking feelings of both being cherished and a sense of awe, I'm using my hands to physically combine both emotions, and this will help me generate these emotions simultaneously in Natalie during her religious experience. Very, it'd be very rare to get both those feelings together and combined into one sort of uh, one image of kind of both intense awe and feeling of. Everything is so much more than me, and I'm tiny, and at the same time, absolutely just being, being cherished and sort of and held in that. But as in well. a way, that sort of the feeling of being cherished makes it even more special to know that you are insignificant, and yet someone's so still willing to cherish you that much. It's like, well, I must be that bit special. <laughs> With over half of my 15 minutes gone, I feel I am close to giving Natalie the experience of a religious conversion. Uh, I'm now going to illustrate the next step we're going to take in the journey to give Natalie a powerful religious experience. So, I have here a little bottle of a very powerful peppermint oil. When I open this, it's strong enough that the smell will permeate the room. Obviously, it's going to be fainter for those of you at the back. It'll be fairly faint by the time it reaches all of you. But uh, what I want you to do, as soon as you smell it, is to put your hand up. And the point of this is to see how a scent moves around a room, because it's not quite in the way that you might think it will. So the moment you smell it, it will only be faint. Please put your hand up. your hands up. Anyone else? Good. 
Excellent. Thank you very much. You can drop your hands now. Thank you very much. Good. Uh, so here's the twist. Uh, the smell was not, in fact, generated by the peppermint oil. That is not peppermint oil. That's actually just water. There you go, Connor, if you smell that. Nothing in there, is there? It's just water. You smell anything at all? Nothing. No. <laughs> Nothing at all. Now that will relax you quite nicely. <laughs> <laughs> See me afterwards. <laughs> the smell was actually generated by a sound wave. If you transmit a sound wave at 18.98 hertz into a contained space, such as we've done with you guys here, there are sort of hidden speakers, black speakers there, there's one there, one over there, and one just there that are transmitting the sound wave into a contained space. Um, if you do that, it resonates. The sound will resonate with a very small part of the brain responsible for smell, and it gives a lot of people, not everybody of course, but a large number of people, a definite sensation of smelling something sort of fresh and minty. And the fun thing is, this can also be done through the television set. So, we're going to try this now. I will give you instructions in a moment. And if you're good at this and you do smell it, because not everybody can, and particularly if you're on Twitter, will you please let us know uh, by tweeting using the hashtag Darren Smells. Hashtag Hashtag Darren smells. Good, thank you. So, we have been testing this over the past few weeks and have found out the following measures make it work better. So, as I said before the break, please close any windows. Right, now this isn't obviously to actually keep the smell in per se, but it allows the sound wave to bounce back into the room. Uh, secondly, if you can, turn up the bass on your TV set or speakers. If you have a subwoofer, turn it up as well. It'll still work without this, but it does seem that it can be more effective uh, if the bass is turned up. Thirdly, remove any existing scent uh, of mint that you ha might have in the room. Okay. Next, come close to your TV. You need to be about six feet from it if possible. You need to sit, please, not stand, and relax. Your brain needs to be relaxed, so just avoid all other distractions. So please do these things for me now. And when the mint picture comes up on your screen, turn your TV volume to full. And when the mint picture goes away, you can drop the volume again. Now, about 10% of you, interestingly, might get more of a citrusy smell than a minty smell, but please do tell us and tell us on Twitter if you have that. Are you ready? Then let's begin. Turn your volume up now. There you go. So please let us know if you could smell anything, mint, citrus, or just cock, as I'm sure most of you will be tweeting as I speak. Um, or maybe it was the whiff of something more organic you picked up on. <laughs> Pile of poo. Uh, <laughs> the sound wave doesn't exist. If you smell peppermint, then welcome to the placebo effect. It's nothing more than suggestion and expectation. Research indicates that if you smelled it, you're probably more creative, open, and intelligent than those who did not. And if you didn't smell it, it probably means you are more critically minded and less prone to obvious flattery. <laughs> but it's precisely this expectation and suggestion that I'm working with during my attempt to give Natalie her religious experience using purely psychological techniques. I suppose also that you're working with placebos at the moment, aren't you, with the stem cell research, mm. which is... Um, an area that really interests me in you. The show before this show that's going out now is actually about placebos. But there were a small number of people that just weren't going to quite embrace it. They were a bit more skeptical about it. And that was really interesting, I found, because what would make it work and be of real benefit to these people was to actually dispel that and completely, completely embrace this experience. Which I suppose is what a leap of faith is, isn't it? What do you think applying for this show? <laughs> <laughs> it's one of the first things I've ever done that I didn't know what the end result would be. Yes. Because this is literally for faith because you apply and you don't know what's going to happen. You don't know if you're going to get picked. Yeah. You don't know what they're going to do with you if you get picked. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's a whole, you know, few months of don't know, don't know, can't plan, can't control. I am, that's what some people see me as a control freak because I've never done anything without knowing what the end result would be conclusion would be. Right. So this was a new thing? Yeah. It was yeah. a new thing? Thought, yeah. So you took a bit of a leap? Yeah, yeah, totally. Now that I've suggested to Natalie that faith can be a positive thing, all the elements I need are in place for her conversion moment. 
Now, if I wanted her to continue to believe in God, which I don't, she would need to start looking for evidence in her life to support that belief. And this is vital for maintaining an identity as a believer. When we think something is true, we look for anything which will confirm it to us. We find patterns in randomness. Now, I'm going to show you something here with the audience, but you can play along at home too. Take a look at these photos, courtesy of Professor Richard Wiseman. So, picture of a, uh, a young girl, cruel victim of a custard pie attack. <laughs> but if you look at there is something slightly odd in the picture. I don't know if you can work this out. If you look behind her, can you see that? What is that? Can you see it? There is, yeah, it looks like a weird sort of homunculus or little goblin or tiny sort of man's face. If you look at the bricks behind him, you can see it actually would be oddly too small for a man. Um, looking over the wall. Uh, what about this one? Take a look at this. Can you see? Now, this is a bit more difficult to spot. This is a car. Notice there is nobody in the car. It's empty. Can you see anything weird in this one? Face in the wing mirror. Exactly. Well done. Nicely spotted. No one in the car yet. A creepy reflection of what appears to be a woman in the wing mirror. So let's just go back to the, um, the girl there. So if you take a look at it, you can see, yes, it does look like a face, but you can also, if you just uh, squinted it in the right way, work out that it's also just leaves, isn't it? It's just leaves and light and shadow. But we turn that random interplay of light and leaves into a face. And this is a really interesting thing. This desire to find patterns in randomness, or pareidolia as it's called, is probably the biggest contributor to supernatural belief. Randomness is not a comfortable thing for us to deal with. As our brain whizzes to make sense of things that make no sense, we fall prey to just seeing things that aren't there. I wanted to see how this desire to make sense out of randomness could play out in someone's life. So I asked people to apply for a TV show called Intervention. And Emma here was one of those people and I arranged to meet up with her to explain more. I've asked Emma to meet me at this cafe where I'm going to explain to her the premise of my new show. In Intervention, I'll be using actors who will intervene in Emma's everyday life in order to teach her things that she can take and use in a positive way. Hi, can I get you a cold drink at all? Uh, water would be great. Yeah, yeah okay. thanks very much. Cheers. <laughs> Hi, Emma. Hi, Hello. Darren. How are you doing? Darren, nice to see nice you. Nice to meet you. I would like you to take part in my new show, if you're up for it, and it's called Intervention. <laughs> we are going to set up interventions in your life. We're going to make things happen to you. Now, most of them will be fairly subtle and natural. Some of them may be less so. The point of the show is to teach you something but that I think you'll genuinely benefit from and, and, and we'll get something out of. And to prove how easy it is for me to manipulate the world around you, the guy over there on the bench is going to spill your water. Bugger up! No, no, don't worry. Are you all right? I'll get you It's fun, isn't it? <laughs> Obviously, we'll be filming the whole thing on hidden cameras, and we're very good with hidden cameras, so you won't spot them. You will okay. not spot them, so don't drive yourself mad trying to find them. No, I won't. Them. We'll be using actors. We will be um, involving people that are very close to you and people that aren't close to you. And all I'll ask you to do as it goes along is to make a video diary and okay. send this to us. I'll see you in a couple of weeks. Have a really interesting fortnight. Thanks very much. Thanks for your time. Thank you, Emma. Cheers. So there's one thing I haven't mentioned to Emma. I won't be doing anything. We won't be secretly filming. We won't involve her family and friends. We won't employ any actors. But the mere idea that I am doing something is hopefully enough for her to start to look out for signs of my involvement or this agency looking over her. And once she gets that in her head, she'll find positive results for herself without any intervention from me. Her video diaries over the course of the next two weeks show her revealing all the things that she thinks we might have set up in order to teach her something valuable. I had to pop into Sainsbury's uh, just to pick up a few bits. And I, I saw her like a cheapy pair of slippers. And as I tried them on, a guy came around the corner and like kicked my converses across, <laughs> across the clothes aisle. I walked across the car park to get to my flat and a guy walked past me and we literally just stared at each other. One thing I wish maybe I did do was just smile a bit more. A young guy came running up to me, waving this 10 pound note at me. And he said, oh, I'm really sorry, but I've just, uh, found this, it must have come from you, have you dropped it? These little events are getting me thinking a lot more than what perhaps, you know, I would have had I not be doing these diaries. The penny dropped. I'm thinking this is about an intervention in me and my life. You know, I've established what things are that I'd like to change, I guess. Is it now up to me 
to change that. Hi, Emma. It sounded like by the end of it, you were starting to get a sense that there was maybe a little more going on than, than we'd yeah. said. So even though I did nothing, you attributed these random events in your life to me, much like I think believers do with God, and then you tried to learn something from them. So even though now you know it wasn't real, did you, did you take anything from the experience? It sounded like you did. I'm a huge worrier, so I've made a point now of not worrying so much. Um, I'm a bit more spontaneous now as well, um, and I make a point of seeing my friends more, which is something that I needed to do, so. That's fantastic. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Emma. Thanks. So, I'm reaching the climax of my attempts to give Natalie a strong and powerful religious experience. You've already seen me introduce the idea of a perfect father figure, elicit and combine feelings of awe and being cherished, and allow her to notice a grand plan in her life. I've also attached these feelings to the tapping of my finger so that I can bring them all back in an instant. I'm now going to leave her alone in the church so she can take it all in. And I'm hoping she will piece all of these together and have a powerful and very real experience. And what you're about to see now has no music or effects placed over it. Instead, I want you to experience what happened as it happened. Um, brilliant. I'm actually just going to nip out for uh, two minutes and leave you here, leave you here for a second. Um, uh, I th I th it's actually really, really interesting talking to you. I do think there are so many beliefs and I suppose new experiences, things that are new and surprising that could literally be sort of right in front of us and we don't even quite register that they're there until one day when we just stand up and then we feel that new thing which can be really rich and very powerful and right there and really and really hit us in a very real way. Um, and we can surprise ourselves. Anyway, I'm going to come back in just one second. Stand back. Stretch your legs, you don't need to, you can, you know, get up okay. and move around if you like. We're going to meet her in a bit, but first let's hear her initial reaction to the experience. Yeah, talk to me. Why couldn't I have had this all my life? You know what I'm I've had moments where I felt complete awe at what I could see, you know. I've been to you know, music concerts where you leave it and you're just on such a high because the talent you've seen on stage has just blown you away. And, Oh, it's like the love, the love I get from my family and my friends. I just felt that times a thousand. When you st just when you stood up. <sighs> oh God! Oh God! <laughs> how do you feel when you think about God now compared to how you were earlier on when you came in? Like a uh, unconditional love that, that will always be there, no matter what, I don't know. Oh, it's so conflicting. <laughs> so you think it doesn't quite fit into your 
Uh, Sci scientific. Yeah. Mind, yeah, yeah. Mind <laughs> Ever the scientist. Oh, God. Do you want to go and get some... Can I some water? Oh, or? water, please. Some water. <laughs> Here's Natalie, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, now, we've kept you out of the way. You haven't been following anything that we've been talking about here. You don't know what this program has been about. Yeah, we got Excellent. Clear, yeah. um, but they have been following your story, and they've seen what's, what happened to you the other day. Can I just ask you, what was that moment like when you stood up? Because it was an extraordinary reaction. What, can you put into words what that felt like, that moment? It just felt as though all the love in the world had been thrown at me. and. It was completely overwhelming. I, 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 you saw I couldn't really handle it because it felt as though that love had always been available to me, but I kind of pushed it away or, or mistreated it somehow by not letting it into my life. Mm -hmm. It's as if my spectrum has just been broadened. You know, it, it's as if I have this barometer of emotion from really, really bad to really, really good, and that high end has just been extended. You, you said to me, um that day after we'd sort of finished filming, you said this has to be something supernatural because it wasn't anything well, that you, felt you could, yeah. you could explain. Technically, as a yeah. <laughs> yeah. textbook definition is something unexplained mm. is maybe supernatural, but again, because I don't believe in a supernatural, I'm still searching <laughs> to so identify that source. It must yeah, set totally, up yeah. conflicts, some conflicts yeah, in your mind. So you're still sort of searching through that by the sound of it. <laughs> still mulling over what happened nearly a week ago, yeah. Excellent. I feel duty bound to make sure that you don't leave this experience with a with a religious belief that I've sort of just given you um, I think but as I think the emotions and I think everything you've taken from it is hugely positive but it's important to me that you can separate the emotions that you felt and everything positive that you've taken from this from uh, from a religious belief mm -hmm. so let me explain to you what I did I elicited feelings from you, emotions from you, but getting you to imagine a perfect father, um, uh, getting you to imagine a sense of awe, and as I asked you about those things, as you kind of internally found those states, as I asked you what it would feel like, I started tapping on the table, and in the same way that if you listen to a song, it can take you back to, um, I you remember, know, I do remember with, the tapping, I'm you remember thinking, the tapping, is he yeah. bored? <laughs> is it, no, I'm bored, no, I'm far from it. But every time you did that, every time I tapped, I was starting to associate those feelings with the tap. Like, yeah. as I say, when you listen to a song, when you've broken up with somebody, and then yeah. you hear the song again years later, it makes you immediately feel terrible. Exactly the same idea. And I was building on that throughout. I also introduced um, the idea of faith to you as a positive thing. I started to reframe it as something that could be positive. I introduced the idea of agency in your life, the idea that there could be a plan. These were subtle things. I never mentioned God, but I was bit by bit just giving you these, uh, these thoughts and feelings one at a time and stealing all the emotions with this tap. And then when I stood up, I said you can take all of those images in your head and I sort of, I did this, I sort of showed you them in front of you like that so that if you were to stand up, you'd actually walk through them. And I said that some people do stand up and feel this, uh, and I tapped, I tapped on the table, leaving you with that suggestion, which is entirely unconscious. Yeah. So it's not something you'd be processing or thinking about. You wouldn't know I was doing it, but your unconscious is picking up on all of those things. When you did stand up, it simply triggered off those emotions that I'd given you, all in one very powerful moment, which is the experience, pretty much, of a religious conversion. Me telling you that now, does that devalue it? It has added a kind of artificial element to it for me now. Okay. Um, but again, I suppose inducing an emotional reaction to something, if it's to external influences, it's always artificial in a way, you know, if it's from listening to an amazing piece of music, that's an mm. emotional stimulus that's come from an artificial source, so exactly. it's, it's all... Um, the emotions are real, that's yeah. the point. It's just important to me that you don't feel it has to be attached to something supernatural or superstitious because it wasn't. Okay. And it's not even like it came from me. It certainly didn't come from God. It just it came from you. And those are real, perfectly real, real emotions that, as you said, have expanded now your emotional repertoire and things that you can now carry with you for the rest of your life, but you don't need to attach them to anything superstitious. It's important that I leave you with that knowledge so you're not being fooled by anything. Right? That's, that's important. But Natalie, thank you very, very much indeed. Thank you for doing this and thank you for coming. Thank you. Um, I think, I think the most honest answer to the question, why do you believe in God, is because it makes me happy. There's no reason to argue with that. We all find ways of making ourselves happy. 
and understanding religious experience as a human process is to me far more resonant and, 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 and a more beautiful approach because it's real and it shows how astonishing we are and what emotional riches we are capable of. We each live an extraordinary and improbable life. Thank you, Natalie. Thank you, all of you. And thank you for watching at home. Good night.